Junk is not a kick. It is a way of life. My first experience with junk was during the war, about 1944 or 1945. I had made the acquaintance of a man named Norton who was working in a shipyard at the time. Norton, whose real name was Morelli or something like that, had been discharged from the peacetime army for forging a paycheck. It was classified 4F for reasons of bad character. He looked like George Rath, but was taller. Norton was trying to improve his English and achieve a smooth, affable manner. Affability, however, did not come natural to him. In repose, his expression was sullen and mean. You knew you always had that mean look when you turned your back. Norton was a hard-working thief, and he did not feel right unless he stole something every day from the shipyard where he worked. A tool, some canned goods, a pair of overalls, anything at all. One day he called me up and said he had stolen a Tommy gun. Could I find someone to buy it? I said, maybe, bring it over. The housing shortage was getting underway. I paid $15 a week for a dirty apartment that opened onto a companionway and never got any sunlight. The wallpaper was flicking off because the radiator leaked steam when there was any steam in it to leak. The place was full of roaches, and occasionally I killed a bedbug. I was sitting by the radiator, a little damp from the steam, when I heard Norton's knock. I opened the door, and there he was, standing in the dark hall, with a big parcel wrapped in brown paper under his arm. He smiled and said, Hello. I said, Come in, Norton, take off your coat. He unwrapped the Tommy gun, and we assembled it and snapped the firing pin. I said I would find someone to buy it. Norton said, Oh, here's something else I picked up. It was a flat yellow box with five one-half grain cigarettes of morphine tartrate. This is just a sample, he said, indicating the morphine. I've got 15 of these boxes at home, and I can get more if you get rid of these. I said, I'll see what I can do. At that time, I had never used any junk, and it did not occur to me to try it. I began looking for someone to buy the two items, and that is how I ran into Roy and Erna. I knew a young hoodlum from upstate New York who was working as a short-order cook in Rikers. Cooling off, he explained. I called him and said I had something to get rid of and made an appointment to meet him in the Angle Bar on 8th Avenue near 42nd Street. The bar was a meeting place for 42nd Street hustlers a peculiar breed of four-flushing would-be criminals. They're always looking for a set-up man, someone to plan jobs and tell them exactly what to do. Since no set-up man would have anything to do with people so obviously inept, unlucky, and unsuccessful... They go on looking, fabricating preposterous lies about their big scores, cooling off as dishwashers, soda jerks, waiters, occasionally rolling a drunk or a timid queer, looking, always looking for the set-up man with a big job who will say, I've been watching you. You're the man I need for this setup. Now listen. Jack, through whom I met Roy and Herman, was not one of these lost sheep looking for the shepherd with a diamond ring and a gun in the shoulder holster. 
and the hard, confident voice with overtones of connections, fixes, setups that would make a stick-up sound easy and sure of success. Jack was very successful from time to time, and would turn up in new clothes and even new cars. He was also an inveterate liar, who seemed to lie more for himself than for any visible audience. He had a clean-cut, healthy country face, but there was something curiously diseased about him. He was subject to sudden fluctuations in weight, like a diabetic or a sufferer from liver trouble. These changes in weight were often accompanied by uncontrollable fits of restlessness, so that he would disappear for some days. He slid into the booth where I was sitting and ordered a shot of whiskey. He tossed it off, put the glass down, and looked at me, with his head tilted a little to one side and back. What's this guy got, he said. A Tommy gun and about 35 grains of morphine. The morphine I can get rid of right away, but the Tommy gun may take a little time. Two detectives walked in and leaned on the bar, talking to the bartender. Jack jerked his head in their direction. The law, let's take a walk. I followed him out of the bar. I'm taking you to someone who will want the morphine, he said. You want to forget this address. We went down to the bottom level of the independent subway. Jack's voice, talking to his invisible audience, went on and on. No external noise drowned him out. Give me a 38 every time. Just flick back the hammer and let her go. I'll drop anyone at 500 feet. Don't care what you say. My brother has two thirty caliber machine guns stashed in Iowa. We got off the subway and began to walk on snow-covered sidewalks between tenements. This guy owed me for a long time, see. I knew he had it, but he wouldn't pay. So I waited for him when he finished work. I had a roll of nickels. No one can hang anything on you for carrying U.S. currency. Told me he was broke. I cracked his jaw and took my money off him. Two of his friends standing there, but they kept out of it. I'd have switched a blade on them. We were walking up tenement stairs. The stairs were made of worn black metal. We stopped in front of a narrow metal-covered door, and Jack gave an elaborate knock, inclining his head to the door like a safecracker. The door was opened by a large, flabby, middle-aged queer, with tattooing on his forearms and even on the backs of his hands. This is Joy, Jack said, and Joy said, Hello there. Jack pulled a five-dollar bill from his pocket and gave it to Joey. Guess a quarter shenley's, will you, Joey? Joey put on an overcoat and went out. After Joey went out, I noticed another man who was standing there looking at me. Waves of hostility and suspicion flowed out from his large brown eyes like some sort of television broadcast. The effect was almost like a physical impact. The man was small and very thin, his neck loose in the color of his shirt. His complexion faded from brown to a mottled yellow and pancake makeup had been heavily applied in an attempt to conceal a skin eruption. His mouth was drawn down at the corners in a grimace of petulant annoyance. Who is this, he said. His name, I learned later, was Herman. 
friend of mine, he's got some morphine he wants to get rid of. Herman shrugs and turns out his hands. I don't think I want to bother, really. Okay, Jack said, we'll sell it to someone else. Come on, Bill. We went into the front room. There was a small radio, a china Buddha, with a votive candle in front of it. Pieces of bric-a-brac. A man was lying on a studio couch. He sat up as we entered the room and said hello and smiled pleasantly, showing discolored brownish teeth. It was a southern voice with the accent of East Texas. Jack said, Roy, this is a friend of mine. He has some morphine he wants to sell. The man sat up straighter and swung his legs off the couch. His jaw fell slackly, giving his face a vacant look. The skin of his face was smooth and brown. The cheekbones were high, and he looked oriental. His ears stuck out at right angles from his asymmetrical skull. The light in the room glinted on the points of light in his eyes, like an opal. How much you have, he asked me. Seventy-five half-grain cigarettes. The regular price is two dollars a grain, he said. But cigarettes go for a little less. People want habits. Those cereals have too much water, and you have to squeeze the stuff out and cook it down. He paused, and his face went blank. I can go about one fifty grain, he said finally. I guess that will be okay, I said. He asked me how we could make contact, and I gave him my phone number. Joey came back with the whiskey, and we all had a drink. Herman stuck his head in from the kitchen and said to Jack, Could I talk to you for a minute? I can hear them arguing about something. Then Jack came back and Herman stayed in the kitchen. We all had a few drinks and Jack began telling a story. My partner was going through the joint. The guy was sleeping and I was standing over him with a three-foot length of pipe I found in the bathroom. The pipe had a faucet on the end of it, see? All of a sudden, he comes up and jumps straight out of bed running. I let him have it with the faucet in, and he goes on running right down into the other room, the blood spurting out of his head ten feet every time his heart beat. He made a pumping motion with his hand. You could see the brain there and the blood coming out of it. Jack began to laugh uncontrollably. My girl was waiting out in the car. <laughs> she called me, uh, she called me a cold-blooded killer. He laughed until his face was purple. <laughs>